communicate with family? We're, we're going to be able, we're going live, so. Hi, so it's time for Grandma Reads the Story, and I'm delighted to have with me today Grandma Janet, and um, she's with the foster grandparents, and this is a um, uh, joint program um, between the Pontiac Public Library and the um, foster grandparents of Oakland County, sponsored by Catholic charities of southeastern michigan so let's hear our story grandma Janetta. okay our book is about the swing sisters the story of the international sweethearts of rhythm way back in 1909 not far from jackson mississippi there was a special place for orphans it was called piney woods country life school A man named Dr. Lawrence Clifton Jones started the school. He wanted to make sure these African American kids had a place to live, food to eat, clothes to wear, and a good education. In return, the children worked at the school to earn their keep. Some planted seeds and picked weeds outside on the farm. Others chopped vegetables in the kitchen or did laundry. Of course, they also did things that most kids do today, such as studying, reading, and playing games. They worked hard, but they had fun too. Most black people in Mississippi were poor back then, and many had never been given the chance to learn how to read or write. Piney Woods was a hope-filled place. Dr. Jones loved music and wanted the children to love it too. In 1939, he started a school band that was just for girls and he called it the Sweethearts. Dr. Jones wanted the band to help raise money for the school so that girls were expected to take it seriously, like a real job. The Sweethearts woke up at five o'clock every morning and filled their days with schoolwork and hours of practice. It could be exhausting, but they loved it. The music the girls played was called swing. Sometimes people called it big band music because there were lots of instruments and musicians, sometimes as many as 17. The musicians were divided into sections, depending on what kind of instruments they played. The brass section was made up of trumpets and trombones. The woodwind section had clarinets and saxophones. The rhythm section was all about drums, piano, bass, and guitars. There was one singer who was the leader, like a conductor, who kept the girls together at the right tempo. And the sweethearts had a music coach who taught them new songs and put their music together for them. Swing now, that swing. Now that music was filled with energy. It was jazz. It had rhythms and melodies that got people up on their feet to dance. And like any good music, it told stories about how it feels to be alive. The Sweethearts played in churches and schools and other places. When the girls 
left Piney Woods, they kept the sweethearts together and moved to Washington, D.C., where they hoped to make a living as musicians. They lived like a family of sisters, spending all their time together, eating, sleeping, talking, and playing music. Occasionally, they got into fights, like sisters sometimes do, but mostly they got along. They had a chaperone named Rayleigh Jones to look after them. Ray traveled with the sweetheart, making sure they had safe places to eat and sleep. They traveled in their very own bus, Big Bertha, which had their names splashed across the sides. They ate on that bus. They played cards on that bus. Those girls even slept on that bus. At night, they would look out Big Bertha's windows and watch miles and miles of America flash by like a movie. They were doing something most girls couldn't have dreamed of doing because it had never been done before. They got lots of travel experience there, places that they never would have gone to before. Every so often, a band member would leave but they were always picking up new musicians along the way. A sax player from Boston, a bass player from New York. The original members of the group were black, but the band grew to include people of many races and nationalities. The sweethearts didn't care as long as they could play music, as long as they could swing. They started calling themselves the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, and pretty soon they found themselves in the big time. They got dressed up in beautiful gowns and fancy shoes and performed for crowds all over the place. One week they played the Howard Theater in Washington, and 35,000 people came to see them. The International Sweethearts were a sensation. People lined up in the streets for hours to hear them play. Inside the theater, people danced in the aisles night after night. In the 1940s, there were other big band entertainers who were very popular, such as Louis Armstrong and Count Basie. They were leaders of male bands. The International Sweethearts of Rhythm was one of the very few all-female bands at the time. Women were discriminated against. They didn't get paid as much as male entertainers. Some people didn't take them seriously, but the sweethearts worked just as hard as men did. And these women were good. Back then, Jim Crow was alive and well in the Southern states. Now this Jim Crow was not a man. It was a name given to a group of laws that banned black people and white people from socializing or working together. That made it mighty risky for a multiracial band traveling and performing in states such as Alabama, South Carolina, and Maryland. The white girls had to pretend to be black or they could be arrested. Sometimes they put on dark makeup, but usually they just tried to stay out of sight. They performed mostly for black audiences. Sometimes, though, white people would come to hear them and sit on the balcony. Once, while the sweethearts were playing in a southern town, some policemen heard there were young white women in the band. The policemen started searching the bus, but the women escaped. They jumped into a taxi and headed straight for the train station. The taxi driver was scared because he didn't want to get in trouble. He was sure glad to say goodbye to them.
In the early 1940s, many American men were sent to Europe to fight in World War II. Hundreds of African-American soldiers got together and wrote letters to the government asking for the sweethearts to visit Europe. In 1945, the United Service Organization, USO, arranged a six-month tour for the band to travel to France, Belgium, and Germany. The sweethearts were treated like queens. The soldiers were thrilled to hear those talented women perform. For the soldiers, the sweethearts' music was like a long drink of cool water on a really hot day. Bunch of orphans from the United States. Wow. The sweethearts came home and played for a while. They didn't make all that much money though, and before long they started to go their separate ways. Some got married and raised families, some got other jobs, some kept playing music for the rest of their lives. In a way though, they all made a difference. Those sweethearts didn't know it at the time, but they helped open doors for women of all backgrounds. They gave hope to those who heard them play and they helped show the world how to swing. In, the, in spring 2011, five members of the International Sweethearts of Rhythm gathered on stage at the Smithsonian Institution for a conversation about women in jazz and the legacy of their band. They shared memories of joy and struggle during their trailblazing years on the jazz circuit. They also spoke of their commitment to getting an education, even as they pursued their musical aspirations. It's clear that while these women were working hard and unknowingly making history, they were also having fun and building lasting friendships. These lives well lived are an inspiration to women and men, young and old. So that's the end of that story. Okay. So what was your favorite part, Grandma Janet? What did you, what was it that? touched you about the world? Oh, I, I think I think that uh, the, the fact that they they stayed with it and, and they they um, they found that this was some an opportunity that they wanted to take part in and that um, they became committed to it and they, they they wanted to do their very best and they did and they succeeded in and becoming pretty famous and, and, and getting um, and inspiring other women in, in the coming years to, to um, see their talents and, and to uh, live them out. Struck me was 35,000 people came to see them. And this is before World War II. So this is like in the 30s and you know, women when they got, when, you know, um, that, you know, really think of, I mean, that was really trailblazing. Um, and that people stood in line for hours to see women. Um, and it's just, uh, that was just really mind boggling. And that they started out, they started out with this school and gave, gave these uh, orphans a chance to, to to learn to read and then um, enjoy music and encouraged them. And they ended up going all over Europe to France, six months tour. To me, that's just to start from such humble beginnings and then um, to have so much acclaim in the United States and then all, all over the world. Can you imagine what it was for those orphans? <laughs> I mean, and how outrageous that was in a time when women pretty much were supposed to stay home and take care of the kids and, you know, um, it's really mind-boggling. 
And in the end, some of them did marry and have children. So they managed to, to have a complete, um, com com a complete life. And they didn't really miss out on anything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a pretty cool story. I just wonder how um, made the money work. That obviously that. So I'm assuming that the money they make went back to the school to support the school. Is that the orphanage or whatever? I don't know. I don't know. I, I probably it, it supported the, the band and uh, gave them, uh, because they, I guess they traveled a lot. So oh, yeah. they probably uh, didn't have to buy a home or anything that they, they had a place to, to stay wherever they went and they had plenty of food to eat. And so they, they lacked nothing. And so if they went out on their own, like, like many people do, then, then they had, they also could choose that and, and uh, make the money for themselves. But they, they seem to have a, a pretty big uh, teamwork yeah. um, attitude. It's interesting. I thought the one part where uh, the police were told that there were white women in the van and they had to duck out the bus and then hop a taxi and the taxi cab driver was concerned that he'd get in trouble. Uh-huh. I just thought, wow, what a different, I mean, yeah. how brave, how brave, and they didn't stop. You know, didn't stop them at all. It was just something that happened along the way, and they kept filming, and it was just amazing that um, they went through that. And so um, we have the next story. Okay, this is the story, Attack of the Underwear Dragon. Cole had always wished he could be an assistant knight to Sir Percival, his favorite knight of King Arthur's round table. So he wrote a letter, Dear Sir Percival, I would make a great assistant knight because I'm smart, I work hard, and whatever I don't know, I promise to learn. Please give me a shot. Love, Cole. Here's Sir Percival on his horse, and now uh, he's crying. He says, Sir Percival read Cole's letter and cried. That's right, knights cry. Knights cry at sad plays and bad plays, when they step on something sharp or run into a harp, when they cut onions, when they get stuck on castle ceilings or get bunions or when a wizard hurts their feelings. So they're just like, like us. They have those same fears and, and, um, and, and dislikes that we have at times. So they didn't always have it so smooth. But Sir Percival cried because he had once written a letter to his favorite knight, Sir Lancelot, who had given him a shot. So, so Sir Percival made Cole his assistant knight. See, here's Sir Lancelot's picture, Sir Percival. And, and that this is what they did when they when they knighted someone. They would the people who were being knighted would bow down, and then and then they the knight had the sword. That's how that's how they knighted people in those days. Cole had a lot to learn. He learned how to sharpen Sir Percival's swords, spears, battle axes, and knight pencils. He learned how to ride a horse and swing a sword, how to paint Sir Versable doing awesome knight poses. 
and calm surfers when he woke from nightmares about a big, scary underwear dragon. We never think knights would be that afraid, do we? We think they're they're just brave and 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 take all kinds of chances and not worry about the outcome. Cole learned how to get knocked off a horse, knocked down by a knight, knocked over by a princess, and knocked out by a catapult. He was doing some pretty dangerous stuff there. As battle at battle time, Cole learned how to pack Sir Percival's stuff, lug it to battle cheer for Sir Percival when the battle began. Cole loved learning what made Sir Percival a great knight. Even if Sir Percival was terrified, an underwear dragon would come and destroy the kingdom. See, and, and so anyway, um, here he is, he's all bandaged up. This is one of his biggest fears. Like sometimes we just, imagine something and, and have a lot of fear about something. So so he's treating them there. Unfortunately, an underwear dragon came and destroyed the kingdom. All the knights fought the underwear dragon and all the knights lost. Pretty soon there was only one knight left. Pretty soon there were no knights left. So Cole wrote another letter. Dear underwear dragon, I'm only an assistant knight of round table, but I think you should clean up the mess you made because it's not nice to mess up a kingdom that does not belong to you. I can help if you want. The underwear dragon got Cole's letter and ate it. That's right, underwear dragons can't read. Underwear dragons can't read letters jester sweaters, billboards, signs for guild swords, party invitations, poems about crustaceans, royal decrees, bath oil recipes, moat signs, goat signs, menus, words with ten use, or even maps that medieval hens use. Well, they're not very capable, are they? They're just capable of being mean and vicious, aren't they? The underwear dragon went to eat coal next. When Cole saw the underwear dragon, he was scared. When the underwear dragon attacked, Cole didn't think he would be able to do anything. But then Cole remembered everything he'd learned from being an assistant knight and fought and jousted. And wrestled and catapulted the under and wrestled. And then he catapulted the underwear dragon. See, this is an old cat catapult. They used to have those in the Civil War. Until its underwear flew off. So evidently the underwear was his only strength. So here he is, he's, he's, his underwear fell off and then all of a sudden the dragon, he's, he's history.
The whole kingdom cheered and helped Cole clean up the mess the underwear dragon had made. And, and they, uh, they wrote, thank you, Cole. This is written on underwear. So he's really spruced things up around there. Back at his castle, King Arthur made Cole a knight and gave him a place at the round table. But Sir Cole just wanted to get some rest. All he wanted to do was, was um, all the good that he could think of doing. And, and so when, when they were going to make him famous, he just uh, walked away and said he was going to go get some sleep. Because tomorrow he needed to find his own assistant, Knight of the Round Table. So he's going to have an assistant and he'll train the assistant to do exactly as he did. And that's it for that book. So what was interesting about that story? What did you like about that story? Well, it's that the little boy saw where he could do some good. He saw where, where there was some, uh, there were troubles and uh, he decided that he would do everything he can to try to get everything back in order put everything in place. Yeah, some people or, um, perhaps, would have been discouraged. I saw all the knights. I mean, here they were, they were the knights, they were the official knights, and they all got lost to the underwear dragon. And he said, I'm just a little lowly assistant. And yet, he didn't let that be his answer. You know, that takes an incredible amount of, of uh, bravery to say I can do something that no one else these people that are more experienced that have more knowledge that's been doing it all this time maybe I can do something that they couldn't do and then and, and enough to believe it and he found the weakness in the dragon the weakness exactly no one else uh, was aware of and the weakness was that it was all his strength was based on what you said was his what <laughs> his underwear. Mm -hmm. So when he, he lost his underwear, he was he was embarrassed, he was humiliated, he was he became less than and he conquered. So he had um, to me it's a really neat story. I think all of us can remember or realize that maybe we all have a strength just because somebody else has been doing something seems smarter or wiser doesn't mean we don't have the ability to do something important too and um, yeah I, I like the part I think you, you like the part at the end where where you commented that they want to give him all this glory and point him to be part of the round table. And he's like, uh, I don't want any of this. I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> yes. Impre that's it, it was impressive. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not about um, appearing big or impressive or whatever. It's about doing the, the thing and doing it well. So thank you so much for sharing and reading these stories, Grandma Janet. I really enjoyed the stories. Oh, I'm glad and, you did. And um, hope to see you again soon. And um, so have take care. Goodbye. Okay. okay, you too. Bye. Bye.